Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of MoLab Conversation. Today, we are going to talk about a very exciting and potentially game-changing initiative, which is the New York Taxi Drivers Cooperatives. When we talk about you know Uberization of the world economy, somehow we feel it's quite natural that the transportation workers are always hired in a very casual and precarious or so-called flexible way. We often forgot that in history, at least in the modern history, transportation workers are often the best unionized. Thinking of the railway workers and the poster service workers, etc., and also port workers, right? And in the labor struggle in the 20th century, they are often the pioneers in staging large-scale strikes. And because they're trans uh, transportation workers, so therefore their strikes are comp and particularly consequential. Uh, also, uh, I must say, the like a truck drivers, uh, in, in cases that I know in Japan, uh, were very uh, well union uh, unionized. So it is a very curious question. And why today transportation workers or workers who uh, provide mobility services are the least unionized and the most fragmented? Uh, this is a question that probably we will need lots of time to discuss. But to, the focus of today's discussion is that uh, whether or not we can organize the contemporary uh, transportation workers in a new way. I mean, so probably we cannot uh, repeat uh, history here. Uh, so therefore, I was very excited to find out that there is such an initiative as the New York Taxi Drivers Cooperative. And I'm very proud that one of the members that started this initiative, uh, Eric Foreman, who is currently a PhD student in cultural anthropology in CUNY, City University of New York, actually will become a visiting fellow in our department in Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. So I'm very pleased to uh, have Eric to join us today from New York. Eric, so welcome to MoLab Conversation. And uh, could you please tell us a bit about the background and also the overview of the initiative? I mean, what is the basic uh, mode of operation or how it started and how it is going now? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Xiang, and uh, for, for the welcome and for the invitation to uh, join your, your program at the Max Planck Institute. Um, the, these spaces for critical reflection on the economic experimentations that are happening all around us are Few are, are very valuable, and I feel very um, lucky to be able to be part of the conversation here. Um, so I can I can give a little bit of background on how the Drivers Cooperative came to be. Um, it's a story that doesn't start with me, um, but of course I'm I am part of it. Um, I began my PhD studies at CUNY in 2018, and that was uh, shortly after I had begun working as a labor educator in the what people call the for hire vehicle industry in New York City. Uh, the for hire vehicle industry is a term people use to refer to the taxi industry, the limousine, the black car industry, which is sort of a luxury um, segment, and Uber and Lyft, which have fit themselves in regular in the into the regulatory structure of the black car industry, um, but operate a bit differently as what they call ride share or ride hailing. Um, so, the idea of a cooperative uh, comes from drivers themselves. Um, when I began working in this sector as a labor educator and began listening to workers. Uh, what I'd hear from workers is that they, sure, a union sounded good, but the thing that really sparked their imagination, where you see people's eyes light up, was this idea of, well, why don't we start our own app? Um, and I think this is because, uh, in maybe giving a little bit of a broader context of, of um, you know, in New York City, there are currently about 85,000 workers who drive for Uber and Lyft. Uh, it's a 91% immigrant workforce. Um, out of a broader workforce of over 100,000 drivers who are also driving taxi cabs or what they call liveries or luxury limousines. Um, and so it's an enormous workforce. Um, it's enormous, but it's also very fragmented. Um, so I could, I could give a little bit of the historical background of um, what set the stage for Uber's arrival in New York City. Um, 
I, I think there's sort of, if you take kind of the long view, there are some very interesting uh, patterns uh, that become apparent and how the industry has evolved and how drivers have organized themselves. Um, you can see maybe the outlines of what some people would identify as a Polanyian double movement um, at work, uh, both through the actions of workers and the actions of city regulators and state regulators. Um, but maybe I might be going a little bit too far afield. So maybe just zeroing back in on, on the cooperative itself. Um, mm -hmm. When I was working, I was working at a labor nonprofit while working on my PhD, running education programs. Um, and you know, hearing drivers say that they were interested in having their own app, I decided to create a class where drivers would participate in researching using a participatory action research framework, research how worker ownership could transform this sector. And so basically the, the idea was to put drivers in the place of, in the driver's seat, so to speak, of being the people who are pioneering economic experimentation in the sector. I think um, typically, I'd say that currently, I think most people would say that innovation is coming from Silicon Valley. The, the forms of organization, the uh, modes of exchange, the modes of production that are being developed are coming from, springing from the brains of what people refer to as quote unquote tech bros. Uh, and it's sort of interestingly gendered term. Um, and it is in fact, I think demographically true that the people who are driving Silicon Valley are overwhelmingly men, overwhelmingly white. Um, and it's sort of this alliance of technology development with capital, uh, with Wall Street and Silicon Valley capital, um, which, is cre which has created this, this platform economy. Um, a, a sort of startlingly dramatic shift in how economic activity is organized. Um, my own background, I've been connected to the labor movement for about a decade and a half. Um, I started out uh, working with fast food workers. I, I was involved in the unionization efforts of fast food workers. And I remember back in 2006, the sort of common wisdom was that the fast food industry was a bad job. Within mm -hmm. Five short years, capitalism innovated a form of employment which refused to even consider itself employment, um, which was a step beyond what were the lowest wage occupations with the fewest rights. Um, and in very sort of interesting ways also um, created a new ideology um, of workers, you know, even, even companies like Starbucks or Walmart, there has always been this attempt, I shouldn't say always, but for, for many decades has been an attempt to elide the relationship between a worker and an employer by calling workers something other than what they are. At Walmart, people are associates or team members. At Starbucks, you're a partner, but when in fact, what you are is a wage laborer. Um, you have no stake in the company, no ownership. Uh, you're completely disposable. With the so-called gig economy, this has gone a step farther where they say you're not even part of the company. You're a contractor. You and they're in effect, workers in terms of legal categories are thought of as companies themselves. So if you think about this in terms of ideologies, this is very close to the sort of Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman idea, type of ideology of every actor in the market uh, conducting themselves as if they were a company. Um, there's a sort of, and which means the reduction of every human activity to a transaction, uh, resolving, uh, all of human activity into calculation, as some might say. Um, and you see that calculation happening in the lives of Uber drivers every day, where they're literally figuring, you know, okay, here's what the company's taking from me on this trip. Here's what the company's taking from me on that trip. Here's what the tax rates, I, here's what the, t the taxes I'm paying. Um, it's a very, the exploitation is very apparent and uh, felt and deeply felt by, by drivers. So, I think an interesting way is unionization um, in this sector has to clear kind of unusual hurdles where the given ideology is that drivers are not workers at all and are in fact supposed to be independent contractors. Many drivers actually incorporate companies, they incorporate LLCs that own, to own their vehicle and to, um, in order to insulate themselves from liability. And so there is, um, there is definitely a sort of entrepreneurial streak that workers in this sector have. And in fact, you could, as a worker in this sector, you could view your reality, you could view your peers as competitors. You're all out on the streets competing for fares. Um, and at different points in history, there's been a really cutthroat competition over that, of getting access to certain hotel, certain spots where you could pick people up. 
uh, or um, fights over regulating the industry so that there would be fewer, that increasing the barrier to entry so there'd be fewer taxi cabs, for example, on the streets. Um, there's a long history of that. So unionization is to clear this barrier of workers not, not necessarily even thinking of themselves as workers, and then and think of their coworkers as potential um, uh, uh, allies instead of as enemies or competitors. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, there's this, there's this notion, I think, in labor process theory, which comes from Marx, that it's in the process of capital has to throw workers together in the process of production, but has to also keep them separate. Because if workers unite, then the power relationship changes. An employer can fire one worker, but they can't fire all their workers without major disruptions. So Marx noted that by that workers form new social relationships in the workplace, gain a new subjectivity, um, gain and gain new agency and power, which you know he theorized could be leveraged into transformative social change. In this sector, there is no point of contact between workers. And so that experience of that workers have in most workplaces of experiencing a shared sense of exploitation in this sector is very individualized. Every Ooh. worker has their own debts to pay for their vehicles, for their insurance costs. Every worker is working alone. You're alone and with a customer and with an app. Um, and so to go from this industry, which is structured around total isolation and enemy of workers to solidarity take some creativity mm -hmm. i should say even though the structurally there are these enormous barriers unionization is certainly not new uh to the new york city for hire vehicle industry um and co-ops are not either um these things have all been tried before over the past century the, the first motorized taxi fleet uh arrived in the streets of new york city it was actually with uh, i think french venture capital um, uh, as an entrepreneur bought a group of a bunch of uh, some cars, hired drivers to drive them around, replacing the horse drawn hack uh, taxi fleet. Um, within one year, the workers had gone on strike. Um, and it was a very violent strike. They lit the vehicles on fire, a bomb was thrown in the car garage. And the strike was about what workers were paid, what workers had to pay for, and how much control the employer exerted over drivers when they were on the job. Mm. Interestingly, those issues are still being litigated, legislated, and struggled over uh, in this mm -hmm. sector today. And mm -hmm. so um, I could give a much longer, century-long overview, yeah. but that might be beyond the scope here. Um, no, Erica, it is very relevant. I think you give us such a, a very rich and lucid you know, theoretical and historical background. I think the two points uh, that uh, you mentioned are particularly interesting to me. One is that you mentioned that what we need now is not simply protest or work as a reorganization or, you know, class struggle, but we need experimentation, mm -hmm. right? It's not simply like a change the ownership of a means of production because the workers in a way uh, own their own means of production, yes. the car, right? <laughs> So that is the one. And at the same time, you also mentioned actually the mode of production and the mode of value extraction actually is not directly imposed by capital, but is also invented and designed by these technopreneurs uh, yes. in Silicon Valley, right? So therefore, I mean, so who is the real enemy here is not clear. And this creates a new context under which that we have to use experimental method to address work, workers' need. 